now. Detonate the reality bomb! Change is coming to America. Some alien race to come down and threaten us. Is the singularity near? The military industrial complex. The truth is out there. The seven mountains of the influencers of culture. To be as gods, you know, catapult the propaganda. From a mostly secure, undisclosed split level location on a cul de sac somewhere in the heartland of America, this is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. We're living in unprecedented times. The rise of nationalism in the U.S. and Europe the rise of the Islamic State over the last couple of years, the uh, gathering of 70 nations beginning, well, as we record this in just a couple of days, we're recording this on uh, Friday, January 13th, uh, 70 nations gather in Paris this Sunday to discuss the future of Israel, to try to impose a two-state solution on the Jewish state. Uh, joining us is a scholar of Bible prophecy. He is a gentleman who is also makes great use of the Internet as a means of getting the message of the truth of the Bible and the truth of Bible prophecy to the world. Uh, he is a host of a live weekday show between noon and 2 Eastern time on Blog Talk Radio and live stream. Fourth generation preacher ordained by the, the great Dr. Lester Sumrall. Uh, he's been a pastor for more than 30 years in the great state of Indiana, a place we do miss. Author of six books and, as I said, an expert in Bible prophecy. It is an honor to welcome to the first, for the first time to this program, Pastor Paul Begley. Paul, good to meet you. Good to make your acquaintance. We look forward to meeting you in person in just a couple of months at the uh, Hear the Watchman conference in Dallas. Yes, it's an honor to be on your show, Derek. I appreciate the invite and uh, can't wait to get to Dallas. It's going to be awesome. Yes, it's a wonderful gathering. We'll talk more about that toward the end of the program here. Um, we don't really have an agenda for this particular program, but it just struck me as I was beginning to talk that um, this gathering, which will be in the past by the time this program airs, and this will be coming up toward the end of this month on the schedule. I try to work ahead to accommodate my uh, uh, regular weekday uh, schedule. So this will be putting a, uh, posted up to the Internet on the 29th of January. Uh, so by then, listeners will know the outcome of this conference, and it may be much ado about nothing, but... I, for one, am not a coincidence theorist, and um, when I see that there are 70 nations coming together to discuss Israel, and I read in the table of nations from Genesis 10 that there were 70 nations in th that God divided the world into after the Tower of Babel incident, yep. uh, and then the Divine Council uh, paradigm shows us that it was 70 fallen angels or angels who decided to fall and rebel against God who were placed over the nations, according to Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. Uh, I, I just find that uh, too coincidental to believe that it's actually a coincidence. How do you read that situation, and what do you think may come out of this gathering? Well, it's a great, great question and a great analogy you just did there on the 70. You know, <laughs> 70 AD, when the uh, temple uh, <laughs> fell to the Roman Empire, um, and there's 70s throughout the Bible several times even, but in Genesis chapter 25, verse 23, Rebecca's pregnant. And uh, you know, you got Abraham, you got Isaac. Isaac's wife is Rebecca. She had been barren. She's now pregnant and she's struggling with the pregnancy. And the scripture says, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Um, that 4,000 year old prophecy has never come to pass. Uh, yes, Jacob and Esau were born, Derek, as you know, and they are, but you'll notice that, and they are two manner of people, even, even the fact that Esau and Jacob got back together later. Mm -hmm. Here we are, these 70 nations are gathering and they're trying to forcibly divide the nation of Israel, which is touching the apple of God's eye. Of course, that's Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8 says, you know, they'll, when the nations come to spoil you, they're touching the apple of God's eye. So, but at the same time, he's telling, uh, you know, he's saying right here to Rebecca, you've got two nations in your womb, two different manners of people, and uh, we're about, and they're separated. And I was reading that just the other day, and it said separated from your bowels. In other words, extracted. It's not, it's not a real clean break here. It's not hmm. a real good relationship or agreement, but somehow they're going to try to force this. And uh, I'm telling you, I think it's fireworks. And I think Obama has pushed it when he saw that uh, Hillary lost the election. 
he stepped it up. They even changed the summit. This summit was supposed to have been December 17th. Really? And they changed it. And then December 23rd, they passed that resolution at the United, the United Nations Security Council. Right. And how they're going forward with this, uh, this peace summit, uh, which is all about separating Israel. Hmm. Uh, it is um, amazing how the number 70, as you say, appears all throughout Scripture. But uh, uh, we even find it in the cosmologies of the other nations around Israel, which, uh, again, is not coincidental. Um, one of the things that has astounded me as I researched the book that uh, it will be coming out shortly um, is how history, ancient cosmology, in other words, what the uh, nations around ancient Israel believed, their, their religious beliefs, uh, supports the narrative that's in the Bible. Um, the Canaanites the, the Semitic neighbors of Israel believed that there were 70 sons of El, which was the chief god of Canaan. Wow. Uh, of course, that was, a, that was a, uh, uh, a psyop because God, Yahweh, identified himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the Amorites and the Canaanites believed that uh, the chief god of their pantheon was also named El. So, you know, to, trying to confuse the issue, throw sand in the eyes of believers. Um he had 70 sons, 70 sons of El, members of his divine council that gathered on his holy mountain, which, according to a scholar, a Belgian scholar, uh, wrote a paper about 40 years ago. Uh, he identified that holy mountain as Mount Hermon, which, of oh. course, is the, <laughs> the mountain where the watchers descended and then took right. women of all they chose. It is uh, right there in the Golan Heights, which is a flashpoint between Israel and Syria and will continue to be. And as we record this on the 13th of uh, January, uh, just today was a news item from Syria that uh, they're blaming Israel for explosions at the airport near Damascus that they say was fired from Israel, rockets that were fired from Israel. Uh, I don't know yet who's claimed responsibility for this. So, But anyway, you've got these 70, uh, the 70 nations, Mount Hermon, the, uh, the, the false god of the, uh, the, the pagan nations around uh, Israel, uh, and There is some scholarly evidence to suggest that the modern-day Syrians are literally the physical descendants of the ancient Amorites, whose iniquity was tied to the return of Israel from Egypt. So it's it's all connected, and uh, the Bible is supported by all of this evidence from outside of the Bible when you start digging into it and uh, and looking for it. Um, As... uh, Jim Fletcher, though, who's a scholar uh, of Bible prophecy, says, though, uh, because, as you point out, when you start messing with Israel, you're messing with the apple of God's eye. He said, you know, really pity those 70 nations instead of uh, anyone who comes against Israel, because God has their back. Well, these are great points you just brought out. And what concerns me is the United States is one of the seven. Yes. I mean, uh, what's weird is uh, the Obama administration abstained and allowed the United Nations Security Council passed by a vote of 14 to nothing, mm-hmm. but then turned around and said, but we'll vote against it, okay? Uh, as if, to, but you don't have clean hands when you do that. And so at some point, you know, I look at Genesis chapter 12, and it says the Lord will bless them that bless thee and curse him who curses thee. Uh, I sometimes say, I'm, I've been praying, God, please don't let this cursing be upon America, mm-hmm. but let it be on the ones that are orchestrating this, if that be uh, possible because we haven't done it. As a matter of fact, I think America has been doing some praying and some repenting, and we've been turning. I, I truly believe the election was a, a uh, was partially a result of the prayer of God's people. Uh, that you know, could you imagine if uh, Hillary had won the election? To be honest, she would have just carried the ball on into the end zone. This right. would have been a new world order acceleration. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see how things play out, but. You mentioned Mount Hermon and the, and the, and the fallen ones. I was, uh, this past year, in June, I was in Israel, and I was standing on uh, in the Golan Heights mm-hmm. and looking across. There's Damascus. There was smoke rising that day. There had been a bombing and like 55 people killed. Wow. So the war was raging. I was standing there looking at it, and to my left, Mount Hermon. And to that area where Mount Hermon is right now, ISIS controls it, mm-hmm. which isn't it amazing that the it's like the principalities are hovering in the places they've been given authority. Yes. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So it's all connected. Just like you said, all the pagan worship, 
all of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Moabites, all of them that were involved in pagan worship, and were a lot of them were Nephilim or large uh, giants in the land. Uh, it's here we are, and it's the same. Nothing's changed. We go four thousand years. It's the same battle, right. but it's the end time prophetically coming. To right. a conclusion. No, I, I I agree with you 100. percent In fact, I, I make that, uh, and, and again, it's somewhat speculative because we can only see so far into the spirit realm. But uh, when you go back 4,000 years and you look at where the ancients believed their gods lived, and of course, Mount Hermon was one. Uh, another is uh, Mount Zafan today, uh, Jebel Al Akra, which is on the Turkish side of the border with Syria, right on the Mediterranean coast, very close to Antioch. Um, uh -huh. The valley that extends northward from the foot of that mountain is called um, uh, the the uh, Al Amak and uh, the Amak Valley, and it's not a coincidence that the Islamic State news agency, official news agency, is called Al Amak because that's one of the two locations where they believe that final prophetic battle will be fought against Rome. The other being Dabak, the town that was just overrun by the uh, Syrian rebels here recently. So, uh, and of course, Dabak is the name of their official magazine. Uh, but here's another thing. We just saw this massive battle, this long battle, two years, people trapped inside the city of Aleppo, uh, one yeah. of the oldest continuously occupied cities in the world. Uh, the horrors that the people endured there 4,000 years ago, Aleppo was known as Halab, and it was known around the ancient Near East as the city of Hadad. Hadad was the Semitic storm god that we Bible readers know as Baal. Wow. That was his home city. So, wow. yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's, uh, and in fact, well, I could, I could go on, but, uh, you know, I'll let people <laughs> who are curious look up the book. Anyway, uh, it, it is all connected history, archaeology, ancient languages, ancient, it, and the Bible just uh, takes it, focuses on what we need to know as believers. Uh, so, where do we go from here, I guess, is the, the big question. We look at the changes that have taken place, specifically for Americans. What does the Donald Trump election mean for us would say moving the american embassy from tel aviv to jerusalem which he's promised to do and in fact right. the united states congress voted to do 20 years ago but uh, every year the president has issued another uh, you know every president since george w bush has issued a a renewable stay or suspension of this move that congress voted for for national security interests. And of course, President Obama just renewed that uh, in December. Um, when that suspension ends, if Mr. Trump is true to his word, the embassy will move to Jerusalem. What does that mean for, what does that mean for America? It's a great question, Derek. Uh, it's a six month stay each time a president does it. So he did it. It means uh, Trump cannot move the embassy or make the announcement to move it even. Uh, till May of this year, and uh, which is weird because that'd be the 69th anniversary of Israel as a nation. Huh. And, and <laughs> I started thinking about Daniel and the 69 weeks. And but anyway, and, what and, will happen is yeah. if the United States moves this embassy, and and by the way, Ted Cruz just brought it up again and put another uh, bill on the floor. And says we've already passed this, but can we pass it again? Trump wants to do it. I believe that uh, he has the majority now, a uh, supermajority, if you will, between the uh, House and the Senate. It can happen if he wants it done. Uh, Obama and the left are screaming for it not to happen. <clears throat> and even John Kerry said a week ago that if it is done, that it will cause an explosion in the Middle East. That, to me, was like a code word. Mm -hmm. so to say, guys, if they try to do this, go ahead and, and just tear loose. And um, Trump's the kind of guy, though, he doesn't really care. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's staring down the media. He's staring down the establishment, Republicans and Democrats. He just doesn't care. Uh, he's staring down the intelligence agency. He's staring down the Fed chair, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve. So I don't think he cares. And I really think that uh, what's going to come out of the uh, summit in Paris will be they will draft a resolution to divide Israel back to maybe even the 49 green line. And Israel, of course, is going to reject it. And um, it's going to, they will come into next year, or this year, I should say, when the General Assembly gathered in the fall. It'll be a big time deal. 
uh, and Trump will threaten to, to defund the UN. I mean, he doesn't care. He just he doesn't know what if it's really worth it or not. So he'll threaten and then compromise. So we'll see how this plays yeah. out. I think prophetically, Derek, what the scriptures have said are going to happen uh, uh, is going is you know this is the uh, Jerusalem's the cup of trembling. It's the burdensome stone, and yeah. we're going to be in Zechariah 12 this year. I, I see it happening. So let's see how that plays out. Hmm. There, there is a sense, I think, that, that uh, and we see by the exit polls that back in November, about 80% of evangelical Christians in America voted in favor or voted for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton. Um, and one of the concerns I had was that uh, we Christians would take the uh, election results as, um, uh, you know, God showing us favor and say, okay, great. We, we dodged a bullet. Everything is fine now. We can, we can go back to sleep. Uh, no. What do you think, what is the proper response of Christians to the Trump presidency? I think that uh, God did answer prayer. Uh, it, it's, too amaz- it's too amazing. Uh, it was too big of an upset. Uh, the media, everybody was sure Hillary's going to win. When Hillary spends $2.5 million for a fireworks display, that you don't spend that <laughs> unless you think for sure you're winning. You're going to okay. use it, yeah. Yeah, but— uh, God narrowly through the Midwest there, uh, picking those states off very close, just had to be the hand of God. Now that, he, that we've won, and I should say we, 80% of them in evangelicals voted for Trump. Mm-hmm. It's not time to say thank you, it's over, he's the Savior, we'll be fine. No, quite the contrary. Now we got to kick it into high gear. The door has opened, and this is the greatest window for the, for the Great Commission in history. The church has to take this opportunity and blow through this with everything we got. We cannot fall back to sleep and experience the 1963 loss of prayer in schools, 1973 Roe v. Wade, uh, recently uh, gay marriage. Uh, we just can't go back to sleep no more. We've got that we're, I think we, the Lord has woke us up, but we cannot fall asleep. So I think it's, it's programs like yours and ours and others that need to continue to push forward and cry loud, stand up on that mountain and cry loud and say, keep going. And I see America realizing that right now. And, and I think part of the reason uh, the church will stay awake for a little while here is because there's going to be so many battles. They're going to keep rallying around each other. Trump is not going to get to play the game like everyone else. He doesn't play the same way. Mm-hmm. He will be in one fight after another, which will do nothing but energize the base. Yeah. And so I think it will help us. We don't like conflict, but in the, in the end, it may keep us awake, you know. So I think the church needs to step up, uh, go forth with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and we need some Christians to actually run for some of these political offices locally as well as, well as nationally. We got to we got to stay in uh, possession of opportunity. So uh, I, I think mm-hmm. America is going to step up. I, the only reason they don't fall back to sleep is there will be so many confrontations. It will help keep us away. Yeah, it's funny that the media hasn't recognized yet that their their approach to Trump during the election is what motivated a lot of people to get out to the polls. That out here exactly. in Middle America, flyover land, we are sick to death of the media. And it's condescending attitude toward average middle Americans. The the whole uh, fake news meme, which has been turned on his head, by the way, and I, I don't know if you oh, saw Mr. Trump's press conference this week where he basically called out CNN. <laughs> that was a stand and cheer moment. Um, it, it, but but th- their, their attitude, uh, the attitude of the major media is that uh, the only reason Americans voted, anybody voted for Donald Trump is because... We're too stupid to discern between what is true and what is fake news. And we here in middle America are saying we know what fake news is because all we have to do is turn on CNN, MSNBC, and and truth be told, Fox News a good bit of the time. And yes. there it is right in front of us. And it is through the alternative media like your program, Paul Begley Prophecy, uh, View from the Bunker, and other programs, uh, Skywatch TV, uh, that uh, we're trying to get... Uh, we, we try to hold ourselves to a standard of accuracy filtered through a biblical lens. Um, 
so I think you're absolutely right on that point. I think that the more the media co- uh, continues this confrontation, uh, the more people will continue to be uh, energized. Uh, you've identified a few uh, hot-button social issues, which, of course, the church has lost. Uh, l- let, me, let, me put it, uh, let me ask you this, because it's, it's w- one of the things I, I, I have been talking about on my program off and on for the last few years is... Um, what Christians believe, the Barna Group does a, a, a lot of research in trying to figure out or gauge the temperature, if you will, of what evangelical Christians, Christians in America say they believe. And they come back with some results that are kind of depressing at times. That um, in America, only 19%, this is according to their 2009 survey, so this is getting a little long in the tooth, but, in, but the results are pretty consistent when they do this survey. Only 19% of Americans have a biblical worldview which they define as holding to about six key tenets of the faith, that uh, Jesus was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, uh, that he literally rose from the dead, things like that, that should be Christianity 101. Only only 19% 19 of Americans, no, let me check that, only 9% of Americans, but what was even more depressing is that when you ask people who self-identify as evangelical Christians, only 19% of evangelicals, hold all of those views. And then a lot of people who call themselves born-again Christians, well, Jesus didn't live a sinless life. Nobody's sinless. Uh, Well, he didn't literally rise from the grave. In other words, things that we should understand as basic points of doctrine, most people in the pews on Sunday mornings don't understand. So my question to you is, how do we overcome those losses on those social issues when people don't accept the Word of God as authoritative? You know, that's a great question. And uh, at times when you, those statistics, I did not know those statistics. That is, that is one of the most. Uh, I'll send you, I'll send you the link to that, that uh, survey. Cause that yeah. was something I stumbled across a few years back. And I refer back to it pretty frequently because it is eye opening. And it seems to me that we can't win back the country until we win back the col- the pews. Yeah. And you know, we're not, even, and, and these, uh, these things are about just that the virgin birth, uh, Jesus Christ, the son of God, died on the cross and literally rose from the dead and is going to come back. I mean, those are very simple. You know, Christ is the only way into heaven is through Jesus. I mean, we're staying very simple with the doctrine here. We're not even going to get in, you know, and if we've only got 9% of the Christians of the world that understand that and believe that we got a huge problem. Right. Right. Huge problem. So, uh, because if I they don't, if they don't, yeah. if they don't accept that there's an ultimate and, and uh, objective standard of truth, right? Then, then it becomes very easy to start rationalizing yourself a, away a, away from confrontation. Well, these people, well, yeah, I mean, everybody deserves love. So what if it's you know two men or two women or three right. men or, or you know two two guys and a lizard? You know, it doesn't matter anymore. It's just whatever you makes you feel good is is okay if you don't accept that there's a, there's an ultimate you know objective standard of of right and wrong um and, and i think we've lost that and and again it seems to me that it's going to be near impossible to win the culture war on, until we win back our churches and when we see church right yeah you know the days of noah jesus said as it yeah. wasn't the days of noah so shall be in the coming of the son of man well you go back and look at the days of noah and uh, it was just total um, chaos uh, among the, those that were supposed to be following God in some way. You had violence. The land was filled with violence. Men's hearts were on evil continually. Every imagination of the thought was on evil. Uh, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. In other words, there was no moral standards at right, all. Right. And we're in the same boat. I mean, we're in the same boat. And we're even talking about in the church. We're not even yeah. talking about the world. Right. Uh, there's been so much uh, lackluster, lukewarm, compromising of sin. And I'm not even not even going very, I mean, we're just talking about basics here. It's very simple. And so it is a huge issue. But God always, here's what I've always understood. God always resurrects people from nowhere to bring back the righteousness to the body of Christ. You could study throughout his, historically of the church I mean, we've had our Billy Sundays to our D.L. Moody's. Mm-hmm. You know, it just uh, you can just study the history of church. God will raise up people out of nowhere that will be bringing, have a prophetic voice of righteousness, and there will be a rally. And I saw last night on uh, Fox News, by the way, 
that 90,000 Christians have been martyred yeah. a year for the last 10 years. Right. It's an unbelievable statistic. And anytime I've found, Derek, where there's great persecution, there's great power. If you read the early church in the book of Acts, yep. they were tremendously being attacked, and they were strong in their faith and in the power of God. The same thing now. The great persecution that's coming upon many of our brothers and sisters in Christ in the Middle East and around the world, North Korea, China, and other places, they have tremendous faith in God. I think it's, it's the Americans and the Europeans— Christians who have really fallen into this cold condition, if you will, mm -hmm. that needs a revival. We need a revival yeah. among our brothers and sisters, and uh, we need it among the church. We really do. And that's one of the things that Tom Horn's been talking about um, for quite some time, and he believes that we're on the verge of one. I have tended to be a little more skeptical, but in talking with Tom and uh, Tom's daughter, Donna Howell, who's done a remarkable job on a couple of books recently. Um, and she was a contributor to a book that they co-wrote with uh, uh, Dr. Larry Spargamino okay. uh, called Final Fire, where they're, they're looking at the possibility of an end time revival, one final burst of revival before we, we get to the, uh, the end game. And um, they're, they're beginning to, to make me a little more hopeful that and maybe that uh, the election of Donald Trump is uh, that that window of opportunity that we have to get out there. And as you say, fulfill the Great Commission. Um, yeah, here in America, we've had it uh, pretty easy as Christian throughout when you compare to Christians throughout history. Yes. The, the freedom that we've had in America has been kind of an anomaly. Uh, it, 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 one of the worst things from a doctrinal standpoint to ever happen to Christianity was when Constantine legalized it. <laughs> Constantine legalized the faith, and suddenly it became a path to power and wealth. And uh, then when Theodosius made it the official religion of the empire, well, then, you know, the, the enemy couldn't crush it from without, so he decided to rot it from within and has done a really, really good job for the last 1,700 years. Um, prophetically speaking, um, where do you think we are? How close are we to the end, if you had to make a guess? Well, I, I take a look at this. Is There's so many prophecies that are in the Bible that are actually in play right now. It's incredible. Damascus, mm -hmm. Isaiah 17, 1. Uh, the nations that are surrounding Israel that are mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Yeah. The, uh, the third temple. OK, I, we don't need one as an evangelical right. pastor. I, I even said this to Rabbi Yehuda Glick when I was interviewing him in Jerusalem. And uh, he just got uh, he just got in the Knesset. He's now a member of the Knesset. He's the leading rabbi, as you know, right. uh, for the third temple to be built. He's Orthodox Jew. He was shot four times by a Palestinian and almost died. I'm mm -hmm. um, sitting there in his office and we're talking about this. And I said, um, we don't need a temple. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm the evangelical preacher from Indiana. We don't need a temple in Jerusalem. He, go, I said, because our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He goes, I understand how you believe. I said, but you guys are going to build it anyway, aren't you? He goes, absolutely. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, we're going to build it. I said, okay. Well, prophetically, I understand that. Now, do you, to get that done, I ask him, what does it take? Well, he said it may take a war. Psalms 83. Mm -hmm. You have to have a war before, and then as a peace process, we get to build the temple. It may be over this two-state solution thing that they're trying to force on us. We may have to go to war with the world and then a compromise, a two-state, as long as we get our temple. Mm -hmm. So he said, I don't know, but it will come. There will be a moment where, where the world will say, let them have it. And I said, well, then if that happens, and, and he said, and that could happen quickly. We could be accelerating within two years of something that, that brings that quickly. I said, okay, and if that happens, how long does it take to build it? He said, six months. Yeah, It's already yeah. prefab. Okay, it's prefab. We'll be having cranes up there tomorrow if we sign today. Yeah, And uh, it will happen. And matter of fact, they even found the gold now in Mount Elat, uh, a vein of pure gold that's worth over $10 billion. That's what they'll use to uh, plate it in pure gold from Israel. Wow. Just, yeah, and this is something. He says to me, uh, he was reading about the creation. He's reading the Torah. He says, I'm reading the Torah, and it says, and the gold in that land was good. And he said, wait a minute, Lord, what gold? Because never has gold been mined out of the land of Israel. Yeah. 
I said, wait a minute, what go? So he went uh, in prayer, he told me. He went to the uh, nation of Israel. He went, I mean, he went to the government, talked to Benjamin Netanyahu and others in the government, said, hey, the Torah says there's gold in Israel, so we need to find the gold. And he said, I've been in prayer, and the Lord is leading me to Mount Elat. So the government gave him permission, and they brought in a, uh, I forgot the name of what the, the groups that find minerals in the earth, but they did this survey, and they found this vein of gold in Mount Elat, which is unbelievable, worth $10 billion. They believe there's $10 billion, it could be more, that will be mined out of Israel. And they're going to use it for the third temple. So this is an unbelievable revelation. So I, I want to say, if you look at biblical prophecy, there's so many things in play. Well, I mean, there's so many things in play. But the what's happening in Paris, the resolutions and the division of Israel as a nation, and the building of the third temple, and the things, because if you go to Revelation 11, you know that the blueprints of the temple is drawn out there. Mm -hmm. there be, he even said to me, the temple is going to be a modified temple like Solomon's, but no outer court. We're not going to put an outer court. We want, we want tourists to come in and walk around, and they can go to the mosque, or they can go to the temple, or they can go to the museum we want to build. And I said, well, oh, that's, that's Revelation chapter 11, New Testament stuff. He goes, I know what it says, but we're not worried about that. I said, well. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, Derek, to be honest with you, keep an eye on that situation, because as you see that moving, it kicks a lot of things into play that's in the biblical prophecies of the end time. Yeah. One of the things that uh, I discovered, I wrote a chapter about the— uh, the Ark of the Testimony, the Ark of the Covenant, and the uh, Temple Mount for the book I Predict. Okay. Uh, and one of the things that surprised me is the behind-the-scenes activity of the uh, Netanyahu government to encourage the construction of the Third Temple. And, of course, the Temple Mount Institute over the past year and a half especially really seems to be ramping up its activities. They've got um, architectural drawings for the Temple. Oh, yeah. They're ready to roll. Oh, yeah, I was there. I went there. I see, They've got not only the Golden Menorah, but I sat there and looked at their golden shoe bread table, yep. the golden altar, the the high priest's garment, the breastplate that has the 12 uh, stones in it. They, it took them 11 years to find the one missing stone. Wow. They've got the goats. they got the seven silver trumpets. I mean, they, they've got everything. They've they got the, the, the covenant, but the, they say they know where it's at. Exactly, right. So, uh, you know, and the breeding program, right. the breeding program for the red heifer. There you go. It's in full... I mean, they're, it's all cranking. And now the Sanhedrin court has showed up uh, with selecting a person I think will be the high priest of that temple. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so this thing is moving. Uh, um, Bible prophecy is moving so fast. And simultaneously, the nations of the world, the, the uh, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And then we're having record earthquakes, record volcanoes, record meteorites. I mean, it's just all coming mm -hmm. together. It's unbelievable. For uh, people who aren't um, well-versed in Bible prophecy, what is the significance of the third temple for us as Christians? Why should we be looking at this as significant? Since we don't need it, uh, why right. should we be paying attention to it? Well, basically, from just from a prophetic standpoint, as Christians, we've already accepted Christ. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so individually, we've accepted Christ as our Savior. But the significance is this. When this temple is built, there will be two witnesses, according to Revelation 11. It's in the same chapter. They show up. These witnesses are preaching Yeshua, and they're preaching you know, that Christ is the Messiah. I think the whole world will be turning to look at this beautiful temple and the spectacular fact that it's finally happened. But it won't be the—it won't. Christ will be the, the whole reason people are gathered. Folks are going to gather from all over the world to worship or to see it. But there's going to be these two guys in sackcloth preaching on the streets, causing all kinds of pro problems for the whole situation. So as Christians, we don't have to fear this temple. I, I, I know there's sometimes some Christians are like, man, I don't hope they never do this. They can't stop Bible prophecy. Right. And there will be an Antichrist. And he's going to walk into thing at some point. But uh, it's just keep an eye on it because it shows you how close you're getting to the coming of Jesus Christ. It really is the significance of it. It's it. It shows you you're in the you're really in this uh, closing game, if you will. Mm -hmm. If you had to uh, venture 
an opinion on the uh, the nationality or identity of the Antichrist. Uh, where would he come from, and what type of person should we be looking for? Wow, what a great question. Well, I it's, mean, it's somebody uh, that, it, you know, there's been speculation on this going back 2,000 years. I mean, the early church fathers were trying to make uh, guesses on this, so... It's, it's... You know, the scripture that talks about it, the Assyrian, mm-hmm. okay, which you wonder if that is that is that a clue that the that from Assyria will come the Antichrist. There's always the thought you have to keep an eye on Rome and the Vatican. Constantly you have to keep an eye. They're going to play a role. You know, I always wonder if it's if the Antichrist or the false prophet or or, or is there some key player comes out of Rome. Um, you have to always uh, also Turkey is another country, because Turkey was actually, uh, Istanbul was actually Constantinople, as mm-hmm. you know, and it was part of the Greek Empire. Right. Okay. Well, the seat of Satan was actually in Athens. Uh, it was the altar of Zeus. Uh, Pergamon. Jesus. Huh? Pergamon. Pergamon, yeah, yes. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Pergamon, thank you. And, and that's where Antipas was the martyr. You know, he was, Jesus even refers to it in that prophecy of Revelation. When he speaks and says, I know where Satan's seat is. And what's really wild is that Adolf Hitler takes and goes and gets it and right. brings it to, to Germany and reassembles it. So the seat of Satan is right now in Berlin. Right, right. Was, okay. So I would say you got to keep an eye on certainly Turkey because there is some scripture that kind of leads you to think it could be, could come, he could come out of Greece or Turkey, he could come out of Rome. He could come out of Assyria. He could come out of Germany, okay, because there was such an unbelievable hatred for the Jews, Nazism. Yeah. Um, Again, not a coincidence. Not a coincidence. And, and, and matter of fact, it's still there. As, as, and then the Spear of Destiny is even there, okay, because Hitler went and got that. So anyway, there's a lot of things going on. But, I, I wow, every time I think about it, it depends how the wind's blowing, <laughs> yeah. which way it could be. I just don't know, you know, yeah. but I'm keeping all eyes open, all, all, all options open. Well, uh, and this is, again, uh, as, as I said, not a coincidence theorist, uh, but uh, as you point out, Jesus, in dictating the letter to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, identified the, uh, the, the seat of Satan as that uh, great altar of Zeus, the Pergamon altar, which is now in Berlin, um, earlier in... Uh, in, in scripture, in, in Matthew, where uh, Jesus is accused of throwing out demons, casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, Baal wow. the prince, Jesus links Beelzebul with Satan. So you've got Satan linked to Zeus. You've got Zeus who was linked to Baal, not only by Jesus there in Matthew 24, but the ancient Canaanites, Phoenicians, and Greeks understood that uh, the holy mountain of Baal, which is this Jebel Akra, this Mount uh, Zafan in Turkey yep, was sure. also was also the holy mountain of Zeus, where Zeus fought his battle against the sea monster Typhon. It's also where Baal fought his, you know, against the sea monster. Yeah, Baal is Zeus is Satan. It's all connected. It bells you above Zeus, Satan. Uh, it's all connected, like you yeah, said. Yeah. So, so I, I I exactly with you. I I watched Turkey, that area in Turkey. I watch. Germany, uh, I always got an eye on Rome, and, and when the scripture keeps talking about that Assyrian over in Daniel, he just yeah. talks about it. I mean, basically almost, you think he's talking about the Antichrist there uh, in Daniel 8 and 9, and he talks about the Assyrians. So, yeah. I don't know, but you, I think we're in the ballpark, don't you? I, 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 I do. You know, and there was a team picture there, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, and there was something else that was tickling in the back of my brain and thinking about this Pergamon Museum in, in Berlin. You know, another one of the artifacts they brought back there was the Ishtar Gate from Babylon. Wow! So now, that, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's wow. all. That's also there, which uh, was excavated. And it's in, in Berlin. It's in Berlin. In the same oh. same museum as the uh, the the seat of Satan, uh, Ishtar, who was Inanna in the, to the Sumerians, but was also a start to the Canaanites, Venus to the Romans, Aphrodite to the Greeks. Uh, all all the same. It's all it's all connected. Yeah. <laughs> it's the rise of the old gods, you know. And we, we talk about the uh, the change in our culture uh, and the uh, the standards that have been uh, pushed on us over the last couple of years with the gender being fluid. You can be male one day, female the next day, and then neither. You know, Facebook has what you know fifty different 
designations for for gender, you know, you, that you can pick from. Um, when you go back into the cosmology of ancient Sumer, ancient Babylon, that was all part of the religion of Ishtar, of Inanna. She was the original gender fluid uh, uh, deity. She, they, they, when progressives, and this is the irony of all of this, what we're being told is very progressive, modern, and enlightened is actually just turning the clock back to the days of Abraham 4,000 years ago. Um, so uh, it wasn't until Moses about 3,500 years ago that uh, somebody came along and said, you know what, thus saith Yahweh, thus saith the Lord. These things are wrong. That was new. Right. That was new. Well, uh, Pastor Paul Begley, uh, you and your wife Heidi will be uh, on a panel that we will be hosting uh, jointly with uh, Coach Dave Dobbenmeyer and his wife and Josh Tolley, who uh, is, I guess, having to get married so he can be part of this uh, yeah. panel. <laughs> so they'll, be, they'll be the newlyweds on the crowd, okay? That's, so, that's right. Uh, uh, all at the Hear the Watchman conference coming up March 31st through April 2nd at the, uh, the Hilton DFW Lakes Conference Center. Uh, information online at hearthewatchman.com. And uh, we're looking forward to meeting you, your bride, and uh, having an opportunity to uh, fellowship with some, uh, uh, some wonderful people there. We look forward to it, Derek, and uh, see you and Sharon and everybody else that's going to be gathered. It should be a great time. Uh, and, before uh, we go, where do people find out more about your daily broadcast and uh, your ministry? Yeah, you know, you know, if you just go to paulbegleyprophecy.com, www.paulbegleyprophecy.com, that'll connect you to pretty well everything. We're doing two hours a day live broadcasting on live stream, Roku satellite, mm -hmm. uh, Blog Talk Radio, YouTube Live. But we also have a television show. It's called The Coming Apocalypse, and oh. it's on LaCie Broadcasting. Uh, Direct TV, every Sunday night, if you're anywhere in the country, you can watch it on Direct TV channel 367. Channel 367 every Sunday night at 1030 Eastern. Got a half hour broadcast called Coming Apocalypse. And um, and it's on a couple other, uh, four other little cities as well. But that's the main one we like. It reaches everybody across America. So, yeah, we're, we stay pretty busy. Very good. All right. Pastor Paul Begley, thanks for your time today. Look forward to meeting you and seeing you in person in Dallas. All right. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. God bless. <laughs> Check the show notes at vftb.net, or if you're watching this on video, youtube.com slash Derek Gilbert, then um, please look below, and you'll find a link to Pastor Paul Begley's website and to his YouTube channel. Uh, he's doing a lot of video these days, and that seems to be where things are at, which is why, if you're watching this, you're watching this. I'm an old radio guy. It's taken me a while to adjust to the whole video thing. Uh, but we appreciate those of you who have subscribed to the YouTube channel, and I encourage you to share these videos around. Uh, also, please remember that my novel, The God Conspiracy, is being uh, rolled out in an audio form, free audio book format, one episode per week on YouTube, this very YouTube channel, most of this same station, in fact. And if you subscribe, you'll get an update every Monday morning at 9 o'clock Central Time, 9 a.m. Central Time, that is UTC minus 6, and the new episode there waiting for you to digest. Uh, 21 episodes already in the tank, uh, another one coming up tomorrow morning, that would be uh, January 30th. So uh, time to binge listen. Just go ahead and binge listen. And thanks to J Jake Rahutsky for putting together the video for that and also the background for uh, the video that you're watching right now. I do appreciate his help because his creativity is uh, far beyond what my limited vision would create. Audio, I do okay, but um, still uh, a newbie when it comes to this uh, video stuff. Uh, speaking of books, Sharon and I have been talking for a while about the forthcoming release of my first Nonfiction book, the uh, the Great Inception, Satan's Psyops from Eden to Armageddon, and that is drawing near. It's just about five weeks away. March seventh is the official release date, but uh, you can pre-order now at SkywatchTVStore.com. Now it'll be available through all the usual channels, brick and mortar stores, um, Amazon, of course, Barnes and Noble once it's officially released. But if you order through the Skywatch TV store, you not only get The Great Inception, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the book in just a second, you'll get Mike Heiser's new book, Reversing Herman, which is a must-have for your reference shelf. Put it right next to his other must-have for your reference shelf, uh, The Unseen Realm. Uh, so you get both of those books, plus a DVD with five hours of content, three video presentations, well, presentations I did that were videotaped, well, digitally recorded. See, I'm still old school. Um, 
one at the uh, Rocky Mountain International Prophecy Conference last summer, and then two at Morningside Church, dealing with the subject material of the book, which is basically that the gods of the ancient world, the gods mentioned in the Bible, are real, and that we're in the middle of a supernatural war, whether we want to admit it or not. And then I go through and show exactly where in the Bible you can find this. This is not some weird reinterpretation of Scripture. It's all there. A little bit more about that in just a second. Um, so you get that, uh, oh, plus uh, four interviews that we did with Mike Heiser last year as sort of a teaser for uh, Reversing Herman. And we've got four new interviews with Mike coming up beginning February 19th on Skywatch TV. But uh, those four from last year, plus my three presentations on a DVD, and then an audio CD. Actually, read there is an MP3 CD with seven hours of audio, seven hours of audio with Mike Heiser recorded on this program dating back to 2009. And I think we even have one of the early PID radio interviews with Mike on there. So altogether, seven hours of audio, uh, Mike Heiser talking about um, the Unseen Realm, talking about his uh, novels dealing with the, the UFO phenomenon, the facade and the portent, reversing Herman. Um, got him live at Roswell for the UFO Festival one year. Uh, all of those on a seven-hour MP3 CD and a special never-before-released hardcover edition of the Book of Enoch, which is kind of relevant since both Mike's work and my book, which builds on Mike's work, uh, draw heavily on the Book of Enoch and other Second Temple uh, Jewish literature. So all of that for $29.95 at skywatchtvstore.com. You can pre-order now. Remember the official release date, March 7th. That's when we'll begin shipping. But uh, again, if you buy through Skywatch TV, you get all of that for $29.95. 30 bucks for The Book of Enoch, Mike's new book, Reversing Herman, my new book, The Great Inception, plus five hours of video and seven hours of audio content on the subject material of these books. So so much for the commercial. Now, what is my book about, The Great Inception? As I said, we're in the middle of a battlefield. Most of us don't recognize it. If you're listening to this program or watching this program, you're probably predisposed. You probably believe that the enemy is real, that Satan and his minions are real. Sadly, that means you and I are in the minority, not of Americans. I mean, we're in the minority of Christians. Most American Christians do not believe that Satan is is real. Even more distressing is that most American Christians, and this is based on research by the George Barna Group, uh, most American Christians don't believe that the Holy Spirit is real. 60%. More likely to view him as a symbol of God's love than as a literal entity. And it's roughly the same percentage when you're talking about uh, Satan. He's not really real. He's just a Symbol we use to represent evil. Okay. But the Bible says we're not wrestling against human opponents, but against principalities, powers, rulers of spiritual darkness, sometimes referred to as archons, thrones, dominions. Peter says Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Sounds like they're describing literal entities to me. Well, it's because they were. But more than that, when you see some of the confrontations in the Bible, Bible stories that you and I have heard since Sunday school, and we tend to view them as uh, you know, like a picture of baptism or of having faith in God or trusting when things are going badly. Yeah, okay, they are those things. But some of the things that are hard to understand, like why did God literally part the Red Sea? Why did God tell Elijah to go have this confrontation with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel? Why did Jesus pick the site that he did for the transfiguration? There are even some lesser known ones that when you understand some of the stuff that was going on behind the scenes in the minds of those that, you know, the prophets and the apostles who wrote the books of the Bible, stuff makes a lot more sense. Like why did God choose a man named Barak? to go into battle against a general named Sisera. There's a reason, a supernatural reason, a message to the spirit realm, the supernatural entities that rebelled against God's authority. Why is Mount Hermon so significant in the Old Testament? It, to, and not just to 
the, the, the Jews, the Israelites, but in the ancient Near East, as far away as Babylon, which is like, you know, 600 miles away. Why was Mount Hermon so important? You know, there are a lot of things like that in the Bible that make more sense when you read it with a supernatural worldview, which is the whole point of Mike Heiser's previous book, The Unseen Realm. His new book deals with Mount Hermon and why Jesus' mission involved reversing the sin of the watchers. And that's not just the creation of the Nephilim, the other stuff, teaching mankind stuff that we weren't supposed to know. One of the other things that I found in the research for my book that's really fascinating is a literal connection between one of the people groups that the Israelites had to push out of Canaan and major figures in Greek mythology. These people apparently thought they were descended from these mythological figures or figures that we thought were mythological, but they're not. They're real. That's the point of my book. So I'm, I'm excited about the content because it's making the Bible a lot more exciting. So I hope uh, you find it exciting as well. Of course, Pastor Paul Begley, uh, our interview guest this week, one of the speakers coming up at the Hear the Watchman Conference, God's Great Gathering, the G3 Intelligence Briefing. That's coming to Dallas, uh, March 31st through April 2nd. And this week we got uh, exciting news. Pastor Carl Gallops has been added to the lineup. It keeps getting better and better. Uh, Carl Gallops, L.A. Marzuli, Russ Dizdar, Dr. Michael Lake, uh, Pastor Billy Crone, uh, Coach Dave Dobbenmeyer. Just to see those guys alone in one gathering is well worth the price of admission. And of course, Sharon and I will be there. Uh, we'll uh, be sitting on a panel with uh, Coach Dave and his wife, um, Josh Tolley and his new bride, um, uh, Pastor Paul Begley and, and Heidi Begley, and uh, uh, we're talking about serving in ministry side by side as married couples. But more than that, what it's like, what we need as married couples to be doing as Christians on this supernatural battlefield. So that'll be part of it. Of course, I'll be talking about uh, the book as well. Uh, that is, again, March 31st through April 2nd, the Hilton DFW Lakes Conference Center in uh, Grapevine, Texas. It's the Dallas metro area. Save $20. Save $20 on your registration by using the promo code SKYWATCH. Promo code SKYWATCH. Save $20 on the registration. Sign up at hearthewatchman.com or if you're looking at the website, vftb.net, Click the link in the sidebar, uh, this one. Uh, Josh Peck, Jake Rahutsky from Skywatch TV also will be there. So we'll be uh, well represented there, and we hope to see you there as well. Uh, this week, Sharon dealing with a um, second round of this virus that's been going around our place. And by our place, I mean Skywatch TV. We've been sharing it back and forth since the beginning of December. Josh Peck, poor guy, has had it three times now. Uh, so that's why there was no new Bible study today at uh, gilberthouse.org, the Gilbert House Fellowship, taking a week off. Um, Sharon's been, uh, you know, just coughing and coughing and having a really rough time. So uh, we appreciate your uh, patience. We will be back, God willing, uh, next week. But meanwhile, you can catch up on the archives at gilberthouse.org. And I'm sorry we had to miss this week because I'm really getting, um, really getting excited about where we're at in the New Testament. We're about to start the book of Hebrews, and we're probably going to take more time in the book of Hebrews than we posted on the schedule, because there is a lot of stuff there. So, uh, this week on Skywatch TV, we begin a couple of weeks with um, best-selling author Joel Richardson, his new book, M Mystery Babylon. He's got an interesting theory on who he identifies as Mystery Babylon the Great, or Babylon the Great, in uh, the book of Revelation. It's um, always an interesting and educational conversation when we... Um, when we have Joel Richardson on the program. So you'll want to catch that Skywatch TV this week and next week for complete listings. Log on to skywatchtv.com slash channels. A View from the Bunker is a production of Gilbert House and released under Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. The opening theme is by Kevin McLeod, www.incompetech.com. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch. <laughs> This is a view from the bunker.